Why did you decide to go to Dartmouth College? Mm -hmm. Well, I was very fortunate in that when I applied to uh, colleges, I was accepted at a number of them. And as I said, I had this, uh, this lawyer named uh, Matthew Bolk, who told who had been at Dartmouth, and he was then also involved with the foundation. And so he assured me that if I went to Dartmouth, I wouldn't have to pay, and that was great. Oh. I, didn't, I didn't have any money. <laughs> but the other thing about it, because I did get scholarships from other schools, I, I, I had another good uh, mentor good, uh, by the name of Reverend Michael Haynes, who uh, worked with some of our youth groups, and he used to give me a summer job at a camp that he ran. And so he took me and some other young fellows around to some schools. He wanted us to visit colleges and campuses and see them. And when I did that, uh, I really fell in love with Dartmouth because it was the typical Ivy League school. It just looked right and felt right. And fortunately, you know, I was admitted and fortunately I had the scholarship so I was able to go. And so it was a very, very positive experience for me. And uh, You were so fortunate. I was, that's true. <laughs> You're I mean, I, I won't, uh, you know, I, I, mean, I, won't, all I won't deny that. There are a lot of people who are always there opening doors for me, helping me along. I, I just, it was very unique, I think, and, and also makes me feel responsible in terms of doing that. That's why I think so much of my life has been involved in public service and giving back because so much was given to me. How did you support yourself while attending Dartmouth? I mean, you were there on scholarship, <clears throat> yeah. but you needed extra money. Was there anything yes. in particular that mm -hmm. you did? Yes, I did. Two things okay. I did. I, uh, first, they gave me a job working in the kitchen. And I, you know, would, for two of the three meals out of the day, I had to, you know, either serve tables or do dishes, and which was fine. You know, do that for a couple of hours. And then I really lucked out. I got uh, at Dartmouth. They had a paper that they published every day. The students published called the Daily Dartmouth. And a fellow who lived next door to me was the publisher of the paper. First the editor, then the publisher of the paper. Another student. And so he gave me a job delivering papers. And so every morning I would get up at 6 o'clock and I had half the campus and another fellow had the other half. And we would go down to the printing press and pick up the papers and run through the <laughs> corridors of the dormitory uh, giving out papers. And I had a way of doing it to make it even, I was able to get it done more quickly. Uh, you know, you had a list, and this room got a paper, that room. I gave everybody a paper. <laughs> so I was finished in, you know, maybe an hour. I did my half of the campus, and everybody was happy they all had papers. And that was a good job. Oh, obviously. <laughs> did the institution admit very many black students mm -hmm. when you entered in 1954? Yes. Uh, interesting. Dartmouth had a tradition. Uh, for some years of admitting four black students. And I lucked out. The year I applied, they decided they were going to double the amount. So they admitted eight of us. <laughs> and oh that's my. how I got in, I say. <laughs> but yes, it, it was very restricted at that time. Four black students, that was it. And then my class had eight, and I think the next three, few years after that it was eight. And of course then we had the real explosion, thank goodness, of real you know, a, a, a real integration in, in Ivy League schools and other schools. But I got there uh, at the time that it was just changing. They thought they had done a big thing, you know, to double the <laughs> enrollment of blacks from four to eight. This was a big experiment. And yes. It worked. <laughs> it worked. Yeah. But what a change of environment, yes. you know, mm -hmm. to go from Roxbury in mm -hmm. Massachusetts to this Ivy League campus. Mm -hmm. You And you said that you loved it. You mm -hmm. loved sure. it when you saw it. Did, did that feeling stay with you while you were a student there? Very much so. It was a very welcoming place. It was, uh, I, I mean, uh, first of all, it was a big uh, change. It was, the environment was great. I had a you know, room. I had a, my roommate and I, we had our own bathroom. <laughs> we had, you know, everything was fine. Uh, but, you know, again, the experience I had uh, in church where we went out to these other churches and interacted with other kids, mostly white, you know, in a way that prepared, I never felt uh, right. that I was out of place, that I couldn't function there, that, that I wasn't able to compete, and, and I was able to do that. So it was a place where, you know, people were very warm and very accepting, and, uh, you know, we, we, I was able, and other, the other uh, black students were able to fit right in. I mean, we still, I still have relationships with people that were formed way back then when, 
uh, when I was in, in college. Uh, Were there any uh, racial discussions amongst your There were some, but yes, there were some, and they were all positive. I mean, a lot of these uh, white students, unfortunately, had never seen anybody like me or the other black students, and they were curious, but we would talk about it. Uh, not only in the dormitory, but then I joined a fraternity, which was predominantly white. I think there were only two blacks in the fraternity, and really got to know those people very well, interacted with them, and, and you know, we did talk about race, but it was, uh, it was in a very positive way. The only time I ever ran into any particular problem, not problem, but an attitude, and, uh, and it wasn't so much the college, it was really the outside uh, world. What happened, as you know, uh, corporations would come to the college and uh, and interview students for jobs. You know, the major corporation, General Electric, General Motors, Ford, IBM, you name it, Xerox. And so uh, everybody, students were encouraged to sign up for these interviews. So I kept signing up for interviews and they, they never called me. So finally I went over and said, you know, because other people, you know, someone else would say, I went to an interview with General Electric today. Somebody else said, I went to an interview with IBM, someone else, General Motors. And so I said, how come I'm not getting calls? So I went over to see the person who was in charge of this placement program. I said, I haven't been called for any interviews. And he said, well, let me tell you. He said, we'd love to schedule, but we've basically been told by major, these major corporations that you know, they're just not interested in black students. So there's no point in my scheduling anything uh, because, uh, you know, they're not going to hire you. And I think about that, I thought about that a lot later on when I became controller and I managed a $120 billion pension fund and we were invested in and I was always getting called by all these corporations about investing our money into those corporations. Yes. And I thought back about the time that they wouldn't even interview me. You know? <laughs> and now they're knocking they on the door saying, will you please, you know, put uh, $200 million in our company? You know? I said, yeah, okay. I didn't hold it against them, but that was an interesting kind of experience. The college itself was fine, but the outside world was not ready for us. 